Reveal the man beyond the image. Well, the image is one thing, and a human being is another, you know. So. How close oh. is it? How close does the image come to the man? It's, 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 it's very hard to live up to an image, I'll put it that way. This is Elvis behind closed doors. Was it his blinding smile and flashing blue suede eyes? Or those swiveling hips that got fans all shook up? Or that voice that seemed to reach to the heavens? After more than 60 years as part of our collective conscious and 40 years after his untimely death, Elvis Presley still touches people around the globe. The Beatles' John Lennon put it best when he famously said, before Elvis, there was nothing. Elvis's distinctive look and sound are a breakout. He's catching on, not just in the South, but nationally. His live performances sent teenage girls into a frenzy. The way he dressed, the way he moved, the way he danced, it was an all-encompassing, uh, hypnotic experience, never to be forgotten. It was being caught up in a wave of rock and roll and fun. 17-year-old Kay Wheeler starts the first National Elvis Fan Club. He would do anything for his fans. In fact, when I first met him in San Antonio, Texas in April 15, 1956, he said, tell me what you want me to do. <laughs> very cooperative, very sweet, very grateful, um, just always willing to sign an autograph, always willing to take a picture. But while teens flock to his shows, some in the press attack him. Both joy and tragedy, his twin brother is stillborn. Gladys Presley always suffered that loss throughout her life. So I think that's why she cherished and protected Elvis the way she did. And cherish him she does. They form a bond so close that neighbors notice. In 1953, the 18-year-old goes to the Memphis Recording Service and pays a $4 fee to make a record as a present for his mother. Co-owner Marion Kiesker is intrigued by his exotic look. And she said, well, who do you sound like? And he said, I don't sound like nobody. And of course, he was 100% right on that. Marion mentions him to her studio partner, Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips passed on him, actually, but she kept the phone number of Elvis and the contact number. A lot of people talk about Sam Phillips, and he has his part in it, I'm, don't get me wrong, but I think it's important to, of course a lady's gonna discover Elvis. Time went by, they wanted some guy to sing some ballad, and she said, well, what about that kid that came in? So she called Elvis, and he came back in an audition for Sam Phillips. Sam Phillips wasn't that crazy about it, got Scotty Moore to rehearse over at Scotty's house, and that's where they developed That's All Right, Little Mama. A revamp of a blues song by a complete unknown finds traction, and soon the shy country boy will have to defend himself in the court of public opinion. Clubs. Beale Street was a black man's street, and Elvis loved the action, he loved the music, he loved the vibe of the street. It was a hustle and bustle street. I think he tailored himself after the cool black community dressing. Uh, the colors, the flash. In the 50s, he loved uh, black and pink color combinations, but back then, men really didn't wear pink. He wasn't blues, uh, but he blended it with a rock and roll and came up with a rockabilly. And I think that, you know, he was just very soulful and had a lot of rhythm. When you dance like that, and you bump and you grind like that, of course, civilizations and, you know, squares are gonna call you Elvis the Pelvis. And that's okay. I mean, he was just letting all his feelings out in his music, and that's all right. Glenn 56, Elvis fan club president Kay Wheeler goes to visit her at the first house Elvis buys his parents in Memphis on Audubon Drive. During the tour, Gladys proudly shows her everything from her idol's closet to his favorite teddy bear sent from fans. If you were to ask me what was the aura about her, I think there was an aura of sadness. And it seemed to be a little bit troubling. You would expect his mother to be in a normal scenario, 
very upbeat and happy and, you know, polishing the Cadillac. It wasn't anything like that. I think she thought that there might be a derailment of Elvis somewhere out there. And I think she was concerned about that. Elvis's success, the very thing that gives the Presleys a better life, takes him away from his devoted mother. He, this is the end of the world, and it was a terrible feeling. But right away, I changed my fan club into the Forever Elvis Club. We were going to wait for Elvis to come back from the Army. That was what our plan was. Wheeler, his friend and president of the National Elvis Presley Fan Club, is on hand for the press premiere of Jailhouse Rock. I noticed that he had lost his wild demeanor. By this time, Parker had started civilizing him, like, and starting to try to please the press, please society, make him more palatable to the parents and everything. And Elvis was not his cool king attitude that we had in the Texas tours when he was doing that. But there's no turning back to those days for the Colonel or his star. Old Priscilla accepts the unusual lifestyle because she's deeply in love. Life was not the two of them apart from others. She was part of the mix. On May 1st, 1967, they went in Las Vegas in an eight minute ceremony. A happy day for the couple, but his adoring fans have mixed feelings. Well, that's every fan's nightmare. I mean, Elvis can't get married. He's gonna marry all of us. <laughs> but I think first teenagers who were getting older, we got over it. We were just glad he was going on with his life and that he had found somebody to marry and settle down with, you know, and have a life himself, which he deserved. Nine months to the day after the wedding, they welcomed daughter Lisa Marie. In 1967, he releases a new record, the gospel classic, How Great Thou Art. It's music that's part of Elvis's DNA. And that was his favorite music. Elvis was very much a spiritual believer. He sang gospel because that was his way of giving the gift back. God gave me the gift, therefore I'm going to give it back. Gospel had a very important role in Elvis's life. And I honestly think there was an ongoing battle inside to whether he should be an evangelist or a rock and roll singer. And I think he sort of came to some sort of reconciliation that he could be a bit of both, that through his music, he could touch lives. The record strikes a major chord with listeners. What other musician like that did you see bringing gospel songs? How great they are, he would sing that. It was amazing. And I think that was a part of the bedrock. Oh. During the next several years, he also heads out for a string of successful concert tours across the country, making show business history with four consecutive sold out shows at Madison Square Garden in June 1972. To mark the event, he conducts a rare press conference. We were at the Hilton of uh, Avenue of Americas, and Elvis had on a blue suit and a gold belt. I mean, he looked like, you know, Elvis. And nobody looked like that. I mean, the guy's charisma and magnetism was unprecedented. Mr. Presley, I hear from a lot of people in the press corps that you really are a shy, humble, wonderful human being. Would you agree with that? Well, I don't know what makes them think that. You know, there's gold belts and... Uh... 